touch me, what? The courtroom can be chaotic, and to be honest, it's really no surprise. I mean, these are criminals. Sometimes they can surprise you and ask for the death penalty. I'm seeking the death penalty. It's in my best interest. And other times they resist arrest after being sentenced. For these convicts, the chaos they cause in the courtroom is what they'll be remembered by. Delone Redden. It's just another day in a Las Vegas courtroom. The usual courtroom drama is unfolding when suddenly the atmosphere goes from calm to destructive in a second. Enter Deobra Delone Redden, the star of today's chaotic case. Now, Redden was no stranger to the judicial system, but on this day, he took courtroom drama to a whole new level. The 3697. He was in court, facing the music for an attempted battery charge. Just your typical not-so-great day for Redden. The plan was simple. Get sentenced, serve time, end of story. But Redden, it seems, had other ideas. When Judge Mary Kay Holthus started handing down his sentence, Redden decided it was time to channel his inner crazy. Redden launched himself over the courtroom bench like he was auditioning for a stunt role in a blockbuster movie. His mission? To tackle Judge Holthus. Cue the chaos. It's all captured on courtroom video. Redden flying over the bench, the judge tumbling down, and then the mad scramble to subdue him. I appreciate that, but I think it's time that you get a taste of something else because... I just can't with that history. In accordance with the laws of state of Nevada, this court... Oh, Three brave court officials rushed in to drag Redden off the stunned judge. During the mayhem, the judge suffered minor injuries, the clerk got cuts on his hands, and a deputy earned a trip to the hospital with a dislocated shoulder and a nasty head gash. It was less of a court proceeding and more a live action thriller, complete with a high-flying villain and unexpected heroes. But on a more serious note, things could have really gone south. Despite the chaos, Judge Holthus was back to work the next day. Meanwhile, Redden's little aerobatic display didn't exactly win him any lenience. Instead of the expected sentence for his original battery charge, he found himself facing a new suite of charges. Coercion with force, intimidation of a public officer, extortion, and a string of battery counts. That's 13 new charges, with a previous rap sheet featuring prison time for domestic battery. This wasn't his first run-in with the law, but it was certainly the most dramatic. On the day of the attack, he was supposed to be sentenced for swinging a baseball bat at someone, a charge that had been brought down to attempted battery through a plea deal. It's supposed to be judged not on the behavior during the sentencing, but the behavior of that underlying case, which he was convicted of. But here's where it gets even more complex. Redden's lawyer, Carl Arnold, threw in a twist. He said Redden was battling severe paranoid schizophrenia and wasn't on his meds during his attack on the judge. Arnold painted a picture of a man whose untreated mental illness drove him to an act he couldn't fully comprehend. Redden himself couldn't remember much beyond being physically restrained after the attack. As the dust settled, Redden was looking at up to 30 months for his original battery charge, plus another potential 48 months for his courtroom dive. However, he was sentenced to up to four years in prison for an unrelated case. Next, stay tuned for the next case of a murderer who will just not behave. Keith Ferguson. In a crazy sequence of crimes that shook Michigan, Keith Ferguson, a 40-year-old from Kalkaska, will spend the rest of his life behind bars with no chance of parole. His crimes, the brutal murders of his wife and her father, followed by shocking revelations of sexual assaults and possession of indecent images. The horror began on a November evening in Cold Springs Township. Ferguson shot and killed his wife, Tiffany Ferguson, in their home. If that wasn't horrific enough, he then gathered their four children, ages 3 to 13, and drove them to their grandparents' house in Excelsior Township. There, he gunned down James Weber, Tiffany's father, while the children fled to a neighbor, a Kalkaska sheriff's deputy, screaming for help. A tense seven-hour standoff ensued at a home on Golden Road in Orange Township, ending with Ferguson's capture. Miraculously, the hostage he held during this ordeal was unharmed. During his sentencing, Ferguson remained largely indifferent, offering a bleak, sentence me, kill me, whatever. Are you? Okay. Well. The judge aptly noted that something was fundamentally wrong with him. Can I get you to stand up there and tell you to do this? All right, I need to get you ready to work hand for me. Okay, all right. Um, I'll be back in my Okay, stop. Right. For Keith, it was a pattern. For instance, when a different judge tried to talk to him, Keith became chaotic for no reason. I'm not getting into any detail of what happened. If you want to be guilty, you have to say what you did. I'm not saying he caused so many issues that the judge had to excuse him, but that didn't stop Keith from being a menace. Don't touch me, 
He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, the harshest penalty in Michigan. As if the double murder wasn't enough, Ferguson's dark secrets continued to unfold. This same man, now 44, was also involved in a series of despicable sexual crimes. Intelligence from the National Online Child Abuse Prevention Agency led to a raid on his Aberdeen home, where a trove of incriminating evidence was discovered. And did you intend to kill him? Oh, yeah. <coughs> and did you think about whether or not you wanted to kill him to make a deliberate choice to do so? No, I didn't think about that. I thought about it and then the list of offences was staggering. Ferguson admitted to sexually assaulting and raping a young girl between the ages of three and five, sexually assaulting another three-year-old, and even assaulting a sleeping woman. His electronic devices revealed a gruesome collection of 1,552 indecent photos and 233 videos, some showing the worst kinds of abuse imaginable. Disturbingly, many of these images and videos featured Ferguson's own vile acts, while others were downloaded from the internet. Something important to note is that during the impact statements from his wife's best friend, Keith still had no remorse. A criminal, inside and out. Her, I knew one day he would her. She would always reply. He loves his kids too much. Next, a racist who is as terrible as can be. <laughs> Jeremy Christian. The sentencing of Jeremy Christian was anything but ordinary. In fact, it was as chaotic and dramatic as the crimes that led him there. The 38-year-old, already infamous for his violent rampage on a Portland Max train in May 2017, added to his bad reputation with a courtroom outburst that left everyone in shock. The hearing took a turn when Christian, moments in, insulted one of his surviving victims, Demetria Hester. I'm a victim. You're on video making me. Liar. 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 You're not the only black person on that. Liar. Manufacturing hate crimes. You liar. Hester, who had bravely faced him in court, called him a waste of breath and hoped he would rot in hell. Christian's response, well, watch this. If you die, you go to hell. I hope you rot. See you there. <laughs> yeah, okay. Go back to Tennessee, no. too. Christian's crimes were brutal and racially charged. On May 26, 2017, he attacked three men, Taliesin Namkai Meche, Ricky Best, and Micah Fletcher, on the Green Line train as it approached the Hollywood Transit Center in northeast Portland. Namkai Meche and Best, who tried to intervene during Christian's racist tirade against two teenage girls, were fatally stabbed in the neck. Fletcher, though severely injured, survived the attack. Christian's hate extended beyond that incident. The night before, he had thrown a Gatorade bottle at Hester, hurting her eye while shouting racist insults. His outburst in court displayed the same hatred, showing no remorse and further traumatizing his victims. <laughs> The courtroom drama didn't end with Christian's removal. His defense team argued that under Oregon's recently passed Senate Bill 1013, the judge could only sentence him to life in prison with a possibility of parole after 30 years. They even claimed the law was unconstitutional. However, prosecutors contended that a true life sentence without parole was valid. Judge Cheryl Albrecht agreed with the prosecution, leaving Christian facing a future with no hope of release. I blame the system for creating The hearing allowed victims and their families to voice their pain. Hester's powerful testimony described Christian as a white supremacist and a plague on society. Destine Mangum, one of the teens targeted by Christian's racist rant, couldn't bring herself to speak, but her mother described the emotional toll the incident had taken on their family. They live in constant fear, haunted by the attack. The police As the hearing continued, more victims continued to speak. Vajra Alaya Maitreya, Namkai Meche's sister, talked about the loss of future family moments. She described how Christian's actions robbed her of her brother and left her in therapy for two years. He violated places of worship where people came together for peace and fellowship. 
Sean Ford, a black former Marine, attempted to calm things down on the train. He thought about the state's history of racism and criticized the police for not arresting Christian the night before the murders. He wore a mask with the slogan, Black Lives Matter, after all was said and done. Jeremy Christian was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences. This racist will most likely live and die in prison. But for this next homophobic criminal, the court has deemed him unworthy of living. But here's the surprising part. He asked for the death penalty. I'm seeking the death penalty. It's in my best interest. Steven Lorenzo. Steven Lorenzo's crimes left a permanent scar on Tampa's LGBTQ community, and after two decades, justice has finally caught up with him. Back in December 2003, Steven Lorenzo, now a nimble 63-year-old, wasn't exactly the guy you'd want to run into at a bar. He, along with his buddy in crime, Scott Schweikert, had a nasty hobby. They'd lure unsuspecting men back to Lorenzo's place, drug them with GHB, a date rape drug, and then unleash a world of torture and, ultimately, death. Sick. Their victims, Michael Wachholz and Jason Galehouse were subjected to unimaginable horrors. Galehouse's body was dismembered and scattered in dumpsters like some deranged scavenger hunt, while Wachholz was left in his jeep like a grim warning. But here's where it gets even more disturbing. Lorenzo and Schweikert actually fantasized about this stuff online. They chatted about their sick plans as if discussing weekend plans, with Lorenzo being the lead sicko. Schweikert, playing second fiddle, eventually came clean in 2016, spilling the beans on their gruesome deeds. See Lorenzo and you developed a plan to meet single gay men, take them to Stephen Lorenzo's tangible home, and make them permanent slaves. Yes. Fast forward to recent years, and Lorenzo's courtroom antics were nothing short of a circus. After years of dodging the charges like a pro, Lorenzo had an epiphany, or maybe just ran out of tricks. I want to thank you, because you have uh, had incredible tolerance and patience and fairness to me. Uh, while I stumble my way through this whole process. He penned a dramatic 16-page letter from prison saying he wanted to plead guilty and wait for it, he asked for the death penalty. Yup, you heard right. In his letter, Lorenzo admitted he didn't think he'd walk free and even called the death penalty childish. He also waived his right to appeal, and when he finally got to court, he continued his request. I'm seeking the death penalty. It's in my best interest, basically because um, it's a comfort. It's I'll be living a lot more comfortable than I would in the federal system, living on death row, believe it or not. But the judge on seat didn't care for his weird request and said this. And I don't know if uh, what you say is uh, perhaps some form of reverse psychology, or do I care? I will not consider what you want in issuing my sentence. I know. Yes. All right. So I am then ready to proceed. Did you have anything else that you want to say? No. Lorenzo's request was a head-scratcher. He even tried earlier to plead no contest if they'd just give him a life sentence instead of death, calling the death penalty immature. Of course, the court turned him down, but now, prosecutors, probably tired of Lorenzo's antics, simply agreed to his request. But Judge Christopher Sabella wasn't buying into Lorenzo's weird death wish. He handed down the death penalty, making it clear this wasn't about Lorenzo's bizarre desires, but about justice for Michael and Jason. Albert Perkins, a survivor who lived to tell the tale, shared his terrifying ordeal. Imagine waking up to find yourself bound, drugged, and at the mercy of a man whose eyes were as dark as his intentions. Perkins described being tortured for hours, finally escaping when Lorenzo dozed off. Lucky for him, Lorenzo wasn't a night owl. Pam Williams, Jason Galehouse's mom, facing terminal cancer, summoned every ounce of strength to confront Lorenzo. Her disgust was obvious, her heartbreak raw. As if dealing with her son's brutal murder wasn't enough, she now had to look his killer in the eye. He was such an Going friendly person. But for the most part, there was a collective sigh of relief. But I cannot say the same for the family member in this next case. Matthew Komrowski. Next, we're jumping into the chaotic and disturbing saga of Matthew Komrowski, a man whose life reads like a crime thriller, complete with a courtroom drama to match. After a string of mental health evaluations and a wild criminal history, Komrowski is finally deemed competent to stand trial for the gruesome murder of his girlfriend, Shirley Donnelly, back in 2011. Matthew Komrowski didn't have what you'd call a normal childhood. At nine, he had a nasty encounter with a tractor trailer that left him severely injured. Though doctors couldn't pinpoint any brain damage, his 
His behavior took a nosedive. He was the school's problem child and a regular at Bradley Hospital. Kamrowski was the nightmare patient. Suicide attempts, self-harm, hunger strikes, you name it, he did it. Diagnoses ranged from borderline personality disorder to antisocial behavior, making him the kind of guy no one wanted to treat. In June 2011, fresh out of prison and apparently not wasting any time, Kamrowski allegedly went on a violent spree. Shirley Donnelly, a 38-year-old mother of three, had met Kamrowski online while he was behind bars. Tragically, she ended up beaten, stabbed, and left to die in a locked bedroom in her apartment at 575 Dyer Avenue, Cranston. To add insult to injury, Kamrowski then set the apartment on fire, presumably thinking he'd torch away the evidence. As the flames died down, suspicion flared up. Witnesses spotted Kamrowski making a getaway in Donnelly's car, and the police quickly pieced together the grim puzzle. By Friday night, they had an arrest warrant and nabbed him at his sister's place in Providence. Now, onto the courtroom circus. Initially declared incompetent to stand trial in 2014, Kamrowski has been under the microscope ever since. Evaluations every six months showed conflicting views. Some doctors thought he was faking it to dodge the trial, while others couldn't make up their minds. To make matters worse, Kamrowski, during a hearing, told the judge that they were going to help him pay for his bail. Yeah, I think we're family is going to help me. Maybe this was what annoyed them, or it was just Kamrowski's behavior in general. But emotions ran high when Kamrowski appeared in court. Donnelly's ex-husband, Raymond, and her 18-year-old son couldn't contain their fury. Raymond tried to jump Kamrowski right there in the courtroom, and security had to step in before things got any uglier. The son, initially thought to be joining in, was actually trying to hold back his father. Kamrowski isn't new to the criminal spotlight. His rap sheet reads like a bad novel. Assault, larceny, arson, robbery, you name it. With 96 rule infractions during his previous prison stints, he's racked up a lifetime supply of bad behavior. His last gig in the prison was for a robbery that earned him a 30-year sentence. Released just the day before Donnelly's murder, it's clear he didn't waste any time getting back to his old ways. It was more than that, his rap sheet. It was arson, domestic, attempted murder, assault, it went on and on and on. So what's next for Kamrowski? With the competency hurdle cleared, he's headed for a trial that promises to be as dramatic as his past. His lawyer, Colin Geiselman from the Public Defender's Office, has his work cut out for him. But now, imagine a courtroom scene straight out of a high-stakes thriller, except it's all real and unfolding in a federal courthouse. This next story takes us to Salt Lake City, Utah, where a court case blurred the lines between order and chaos. Siale Angelao. The new federal courthouse in downtown Salt Lake City was buzzing with the usual blend of attorneys, jurors, and security. But for one 25-year-old defendant, Siale Angelao, it's the beginning of a day that would end in mayhem. Angelao, a member of the notorious Tongan Crip gang, was facing some serious offenses. Charged with racketeering and tied to a slew of crimes, including assault and robbery, he was the last of his gang to stand trial. You might think after seeing 16 of his comrades sent to prison for up to 30 years, Angelao would be on his best behavior. Spoiler alert, he wasn't. In a move straight out of a courtroom drama, Angelao assured the judge he'd be harmless, convincing her to let him go unshackled in front of the jury. Now, imagine this. The courtroom's first witness, Viola Tanifa, is testifying about gang life. Out of nowhere, Angelao stands up, grabs his lawyer's pen, yes, a pen, and bolts toward Tanifa like he's in the final lap of a relay race. <laughs> Witnesses described the scene as pure pandemonium. As Angelao launched himself over the witness stand, pen held high like a makeshift dagger, chaos erupted. A U.S. Marshal, reacting in a heartbeat, drew his pistol and fired. Four shots rang out and Angelao was down, his life cut short by his own stupidity. This real-life episode ended with Angelao fatally wounded and a courtroom full of shaken witnesses. The aftermath? A mistrial declared faster than you can say objection. Judge Tina Campbell, who had front-row seats to the whole spectacle, later admitted she might have underestimated how fast and furious Angelao could be. No one expected a routine court day to end with gunfire. There's no question, though, you can turn a pen into a knife or its equivalent, you can take somebody's life with it. In the fallout, questions swirled around the marshal's decision to shoot. Was it excessive force for a guy armed only with a pen? The FBI thought not. They cleared the marshal, concluding he acted within the bounds of his duty to protect others in the court. As for Angelao's family, they weren't convinced and argued the force used was over the top, but the court didn't see it that way. It's easy if you slow down the video to maybe argue or suggest that there was enough time to do something different. When you watch it live, 
it's very hard to see that anything different could have occurred. Justice can be swift, and sometimes so is chaos. Remember, stay cool, stay collected, and maybe, just maybe, leave the pens on the table. It's really sad, his case ended prematurely with the worst sentence of all, death. Next, let's go to Las Vegas for a case of a man who just wouldn't listen to the court. Mike, calm down. Michael McDonald. Michael McDonald is practically a VIP at the Clark County District Court. His current visit there comes from an impressive list of charges. Forgery, burglary, perjury, and violating the terms of his parole following his messy divorce. But Michael, ever the non-conformist, decided that sending gifts to his children through his ex-wife, despite the no-contact order, was a perfectly reasonable idea. The state, however, had a different view. They argued that by sending those gifts, Michael had violated both the no-contact order and his parole. The court was less than amused by this interpretation of no contact. Michael's lawyer tried to downplay the situation. We sent two gifts, that's it. No with Insisting, but given Michael's history, the judge wasn't convinced. Back in family court, Michael had shown a knack for ignoring orders, often claiming they meant something entirely different. With a track record like that, the judge had serious doubts about Michael's ability to play by the rules this time around. You know that back in family court, he constantly violated orders. He would always insist that the order said something else. Deciding that Michael's inclination to bend the rules could no longer be tolerated, the judge granted the motion to revoke his parole. I'm not sure that he is capable of controlling himself because he wasn't before. So based upon that, I am granting the motion. This wasn't exactly the news Michael wanted to hear. As the court martials approached to handcuff him, Michael transformed from a defendant into a reluctant participant in a courtroom showdown. The scene quickly descended into chaos, with Michael struggling vehemently against the officers, his lawyer's desperate attempts to calm him down. Mike, calm down. Mike, calm down. Mike, calm down. The struggle intensified to the point where even Michael's lawyer, clearly exasperated, shouted, Mike, put the handcuffs on. I'll put them on myself. It took several more court officers to finally subdue Michael and drag him out of the courtroom, not without adding a new charge of resisting arrest to his already hefty list of legal troubles. In the end, Michael McDonald's found himself sentenced to prison, ranging from 24 to 68 months. It's safe to say he'll have plenty of time to reflect on his choices, especially his unique interpretation of a no-contact order. Thanks for joining us on this wild ride through one of the most dramatic moments in courtroom history. 